Hello, I'm Roy Zimmerhansel, and welcome to another Securities Lending Saturday. I'm your host, and today I'm going to be talking about part two of emerging market securities lending. So if you are lending today, if you are thinking about lending tomorrow, or if you're part of the market infrastructure and you're either lending or not lending, it should be of interest. This is the place for you. So let's get to it. Today, we're going to be talking about part two of emerging markets and securities lending and emerging markets. They've always been of interest to me. When I first got involved with securities lending full time, they were profitable pieces of the business because they were neat. There was very little expertise there. Not many people knew how to do the markets effectively. And so there was an edge if you could do them. I wrote my first article in a magazine about the benefits of securities lending for emerging markets. And the markets that I thought would drive the future volumes. I wrote that in 1996. We're still hoping for some of those markets to go live, but uh, that's a different story altogether. Last week, we talked about the big picture. Why would emerging markets even consider bringing short selling and securities lending into the marketplace? Hopefully we've answered that last week. I'll put a link here in this video to the last ones. Emerging markets, securities lending, part two. This is what we've been talking about over the 23 weeks that we have done. Today is week 24. Next week, we'll mark a half year of doing this every Saturday. Today, we've got a sunny day outside in the UK. And even though it's sunny, I'd rather be here with you, which is saying quite a lot. This is the roadmap for new lending markets. What you need to look at are legal and tax issues, transaction and structure issues, and participation and constraints on that side of things. So those are the three areas that we'll be exploring. As always, if you like these videos, please give me a thumbs up or an up thumb, depending on how you uh, relate to it, or a, a like if you're watching it on LinkedIn. If you want to see future videos, subscribe. If you want to be notified when those videos come out, hit the bell and you will be advised. Right. The first segment, legal and tax issues. That's what the first segment is. And that first component of that is just recognition, right? Securities lending is just a temporary transaction. You're, tra you're transferring title temporarily from the owner of the asset to the end borrower who then probably is selling it into the market, but doesn't have to. Now the borrower of course has full entitlement as with any other owner. But they also have a contractual obligation to return those shares under various conditions. So either the lender gets it back or they decide to return it themselves. And in the meantime, the lender has possession of the collateral. Now they might have that possession on the basis of transfer of title where the, where the beneficial owner that was the lender, they own that collateral. So it's theirs outright in theory, they can do anything they want with it. Or it's done on a pledge basis where they still have possession of it, but only can access it and use it in the event of a default of the borrower. But either way, you've got securities going one way, you've got collateral of some type coming the other way. And the key thing is that the regulations need to recognize that it's a temporary transaction that is subject to unwind in future. And so it's not a sale and a purchase or repurchase, as it says. And that link between the loaned assets and the collateral is very crucial from a risk mitigation perspective. And so we need to satisfy ourselves that in any new market we go into, that the regulatory regime, the legal environment recognizes securities lending transactions as temporary loans, okay? Not outright purchases and sales. The second part of uh, the legal and tax issues, and again, a really super important area is netting opinion. So what is a netting opinion? <clears throat> Effectively, what it is, it's a, a view by a legal, which examines the environment in the domestic marketplace and looks at the conditions that would apply in the event a securities lending transaction was enacted or transacted. 
and collateral moved and there were entitlement benefits and all of the components that are characteristic of a securities lending transaction then says in the daily operation, in the event of an insolvency of a counterparty, what is going to happen if a counterparty defaults? What will happen locally? How are the, how is a local judge likely to interpret that obligation? Will they look at it as a securities loan, which is what we hope, or will they look at it as a sale and a uh, repurchase? Okay. So it looks at what happens when an insolvency happens and there's a termination of obligations under a contract, which it says, oh, here are some of the benefits. So maybe the value of the collateral, here are some of the negative things, which is the replacement value of the loaned assets. It looks at it and says, what's the value of the collateral? What's the value of the loaned assets offsets the two. And there's a single payment or a receipt, right? So it looks at really netting them down as the name suggested. Now, why is that important? It's important because these opinions provide a degree of certainty on what happens in the event of a counterparty default. Because of course, if your counterparty doesn't default, you don't really have an issue, do you? It's a, it's a normal operating environment and it shouldn't be a problem. The uh, relevance here is that by having this uh, netting opinion, what's likely to happen in the event of a default. Now, remember, this can be a complex business because you might be in one jurisdiction your counterparty borrower might be in another jurisdiction. The collateral might be in a third jurisdiction or more, and the loan securities is in a fourth jurisdiction. So it's really all of those pieces together. And you want to know what's going to happen in the event of an insolvency. And that is important because you need to know what happens in the event of that default and your position there. Is it at risk or is it not at risk? Will they look at the value of the, the positives and the negatives or is it one way? Okay. So that's the key issue. And because of that, it then gives you a regulatory treatment for that transaction. So if it's not clear, so if you don't have what's called a clean netting opinion, then you might not be able to take into account the collateral you have. Right. And what that means is if I lend you a hundred dollars of securities and I take a hundred and five dollars of collateral, if I don't have a clean netting opinion, I have to account for a hundred dollars of exposure to you, even though I've got a hundred and five dollars of your collateral and then vice versa, a borrower dealing with a lender, if they've given out a hundred and five of collateral and only received a hundred of securities, the worst case scenario is that the local jurisdiction doesn't look at this as a temporary exchange and just says, no, you have to give the securities back to the estate of the defaulting entity. And you are a claimant for the value of the collateral you've provided. So it's really critical and not only for risk management, but also for regulatory treatment and how much capital you have to reserve. And as I say here, credit limit usage is a hundred percent if there isn't a netting opinion. So this is really super critical. Nevertheless, there are jurisdictions where it isn't so clear and still some transactions happen. So you have to imagine the economics of that individual transaction must be so compelling that a counterparty would be willing to take the risk of an insolvency of a counterparty. And in order to get access to the securities, if you're a borrower or to make the lending fees if you're a lender. So it does happen, but it severely restricts which securities you'll do. You'll only do the highest value securities in that kind of an environment. Okay. The next part of the legal and tax treatment, which is really the third part is tax, just tax itself. Now, why are taxes important? Well, of course, taxes have an economic impact on the full range of transactions. So am I even going to get involved with securities lending or not? If I am involved with it, taxes can affect the transaction economics dramatically. It can put it in your favor or it can make it ineconomic in its entirety. Now, which taxes are we talking about? We're talking about capital gains tax, any taxes that may or may not apply and substitute dividends or interest, stamp duties that are in a market, income taxes on the fees that you make or financial transaction taxes, which happen in a couple of markets. So the relevance, obviously, if 
capital gains tax applies, then pretty much you can kiss securities lending goodbye because it's ineconomic. If the treatment of substituted dividends and interest payments aren't equivalent, then uh, it's still possible to lend securities. All you need to do then is make certain you avoid those periods of time, but it makes it more cumbersome. There's more work involved and people will be less interested in doing it. So you can still do it, but it takes a lot of extra work and you always have the risk and maybe something will get missed and you'll expose yourself to a tax that you otherwise wouldn't expect to be paying. Stamp duties are charges that exchanges place or, or countries place through the exchange based on buying and selling securities. They can have an impact, but there's also often exemptions for market makers to encourage them to actually trade in the market. So a market like the UK, their stamp duties have always been stamp duties and still it's a robust income taxes, of course, on lending fees can have an impact. But again, if you had to pay 20% tax, would you rather have 80% additional income and pay 20% tax or no income at all? So I don't see that as a showstopper, although in markets like Taiwan, where they can, <clears throat> where they can interpret that you're doing business domestically, even if you're not, and therefore be subject to tax, it can become a challenge. And then finally, uh, financial transaction taxes, they apply particularly in examples like France and Italy, where there's taxes on cash market trading, or in the case of Italy, cash market trading and derivatives. And it's been shown that has decreased market liquidity. And so it, it hurts the overall marketplace. So some of the taxes that they hoped that they were collecting from end investors, they probably weren't including, and certainly lending revenue has left the market or left holders of the assets from that market. So taxes are important to understand. Usually you can build in the economic cost of it. It restricts what you can do and how much money you can make, but other than capital gains tax isn't necessarily a showstopper. Oh yeah. Sorry. I thought that was the last point. The other issue is another legal issue. There are many countries have foreign ownership limits where they restrict the percentage of ownership of key companies, key sectors and industries that can actually be purchased by foreigners. And so the idea is that these are strategic areas that the government wants to retain a domestic majority control of. And so that's what they implemented. So there might be a 20% limit, a 30% limit, a 40% limit, it varies. And so the challenge here is that if I'm a foreign investor and I've got this sort of scarce resource of my allocation of a foreign ownership limit and, and I lend that out, someone else might grab that foreign ownership position before I can get my shares back. And so those sorts of investors may in fact withdraw from lending or ne not start lending at all or not lend in that marketplace. So foreign ownership limits are really critical points. Um, now I'm going to move into part two, which is transaction structure, structuring, uh, uh, transaction and structures as it relates to the business, because there's a number of sub points here. The first of them is lending and financing, but first I'm going to get a drink of my Coke. They didn't have Coke zero. So I've been struggling for the last week and I've had to live with diet Coke, which is not ideal. Bring back the Coke zero. Okay. So what's the difference when I talk about lending and financing, the difference between the two? So obviously borrowing and lending for short selling or to acquire HQLA, or they're either trading activities or they're uh, balance sheet related activities. I need to get HQLA to put them onto my balance sheet or to use as collateral. Or in the case of a short sale, of course, I'm borrowing in order to deliver the securities into the marketplace. Now, the importance to market participants is that imagine I have an investor and, and as I've talked about in the various trading strategies videos, a hedge fund is typically hedged. The clue is in the name. And so many of the funds will want to be, want to have the ability to go both long and buy securities and go short sell them and borrow to uh, cover that. So they want to be either to be, be able to go long or short within a market. And the pressure that puts on their intermediary, which is usually a prime broker, is that they may be able to borrow securities to satisfy the short selling need. But what if their customer 
buys a security and that security isn't eligible to be used as collateral somewhere else. Now, all of a sudden, the hedge fund is borrowing, a, uh, is buying a security which sits like a dead asset on the prime broker's balance sheet and they aren't able to finance it. That will increase the cost of being a long investor and in fact, might make a hedge fund skip that market altogether. So an ideal market is somewhere where both lending and financing are available for uh, market participants. Okay, so that you can satisfy both. Clearly, if you can't do that, it's going to impact participation in markets, or even if people participate in markets, it's going to affect the volume of activity they will transact. The second part of the transaction and structure set of issues is cash and synthetic trading. So when I talk about cash, what I refer to is uh, trading activity in stock markets or OTC trading like you have in bonds in the actual securities themselves. So this would be a, a, a borrow of a security which is used to satisfy a short sale executed on an exchange. That's a cash market transaction. Whereas synthetics really refer to derivative transactions where the there is no market execution for that leg of the transaction. An investor wants to go long or short they use a contract, often a, a total return swap. And so they get that position. They can be long as security or short as security through that swap. Now, the importance here is that synthetics are often easier for that end customer to trade because they really just call their prime broker and say, I want to do long or short. And the prime broker is one that really worries about getting that execution and getting a hedge in place if they actually need it. And it's actually quite well treated from a regulatory perspective relative to cash market transactions. So they have definitely uh, better treatment in terms of regulatory uh, and capital treatment. But of course, if the hedge fund is not doing a trade in the market and they're doing instead a contract with the, the prime broker, doesn't want to have the economic exposure. So what they do is they look for an offsetting hedge. So they might have another customer who might be the opposite side of that transaction and they have a back-to-back -back contract now. So that's a good hedge. If they can't do that, then they might go externally and look for another prime broker somewhere else or another bank somewhere that has the offsetting position. If they can't do that, then of course they may be left with the, the only choice of doing a cash market transaction themselves. So from a hedge fund point of view, they have a total return swap, which gives them short exposure. From the prime broker point of view, they might have done an offsetting short sale in the cash market themselves. And of course, the impact on activity in a new market is that a market that permits both will have more activity. And it's interesting, a market like um, Saudi Arabia, which has accepted the synthetic leg of the transaction for some time, but until relatively recently, didn't permit the cash leg of the transaction. But conceptually, they were completely on board understanding the activities and treatment and objectives of investors. And so they allowed it with synthetics and then eventually developed the desire and infrastructure to enable the cash market trading activity to happen. So it's really a smoothing of the path. The next element of it is uh, free of payment trading, which uh, people don't often think about. I talked about it in one of the recent ones in terms of post-trade activity, but what is it? So unless a loan is done as a delivery versus payment transaction, which means I am going to borrow a security and it's worth $105. So whoever's going to lend that to me delivers it through probably the local clearing mechanism. They're going to deliver me a hundred shares. I'm going to pay $105 for that. That's a delivery versus payment. Usually both sides are enacted by the local depository and that's done. Now, of course, that usually means it's the same currency security and cash and in one market. When you get into cross-border activity though, you usually see a free delivery of securities from the lender to the borrower and a free movement of collateral of either cash or securities from the borrower to the lender. And those are really offsetting free of, move, free of payment transactions. Because the lender is just delivering that and saying, here, take it from my account, deliver it to the other entity. And the same with the collateral coming from the borrower, take it from the borrower's account and give it to the lender. Now, that's the majority of transactions in the world, period. 
That's how most transactions happen. But the key thing here is that the domestic market counterparties or the domestic providers, so my local custodian and my counterparty's local custodian and the depository, they all need to recognize that just because there's no specific monetary value to that transaction doesn't mean that it doesn't have transaction and carry the same weight as if it, and so that's what the challenge is. You need to work with your service providers. You need to understand how local markets work. And of course you can make that happen. If there are barriers to it, you can have substantial reduction in the business. In fact, when Malaysia decided to stop short selling in 1998 in the crash, what they actually did was they stopped free movements of securities and that kind of killed any short selling activity. So uh, always be aware of that. I'm going to turn to the third part of it now, which is participation. So the first aspect to that is domestic activity versus foreign activity. Most activity in most markets actually is action by non-residents. Okay. Non-resident borrowers, non-resident lenders. So unless you're maybe talking about the U.S. and maybe even in domestic markets. So in India, for instance, you would have uh, domestic to domestic dominating it. But other than those sorts of markets, and China would be the same as that. And there are examples of it. But mostly you see a borrower and a lender being in different jurisdictions outside of the home country. Okay. And that's a challenge. So although they're the most active, the truth is domestic investors are the ones with the largest portfolios. They tend to have a much wider portfolio holding as well. Foreigners tend to be concentrated into index names or near index names in most markets. And of course, domestic investors, whether they're institutional or retail, their obligations usually are in their domestic markets. So the majority of their portfolios are there. So they are more stable. So even if they're selling this stock from the market, they'll be buying that stock from the market. Whereas a foreigner might go into a market and then come out of a market altogether. Okay. And of course the most successful markets permit both. They permit domestic activity. They permit foreign activity and they permit foreign to domestic and domestic to foreign activity. Okay. And as I say, restrictions on really any of the things that I'm talking about today will reduce volumes. In some cases, they'll eliminate participation, but usually it's an effect of limiting. Activity. A good example of a market that, that really flourished once this kind of domestic and foreign participation grew up was Korea, South Korea started really with non-resident to non-resident and stumbled along for a few years. Then you started seeing domestic institutional lenders and domestic hedge funds starting up. And so all of a sudden you had a, a vibrant domestic marketplace as well, and a lot of uh, two-way activity. And once both the foreign and domestic markets were established, you then had what became and, and what probably still is the second most profitable market in Asia most years. Okay. So domestic and foreign, the other way of looking at it, the other way of cutting that a slice of, of, of a market is the type of investors that go in from a retail and institutional investor, and that's whether they're long or short. So institutional investors have always been the backbone of supply because they have large deep pools of assets, but retail investors have been having an important impact. Clearly the, the famous meme stocks from earlier this year in the U S has given headlines to it. But look, Robinhood was doing it before the meme stocks. Webull has been doing it. Charles Schwab, uh, E-Trade, Ameritrade, they have been offering these services for some time. It expands market by market. So now there's many countries where inv retail investors can get short selling and securities lending activity so they can benefit from it. And so they're definitely having an, an increasing impact on the business. And that's also important because many institutional investors have very similar portfolios. Again, they might be index tracking. They might be benchmarked against each other. So they, although they top and tail things differently than their competitors, often you'll find many institutional investors will have similar portfolios. It's retail investors that bring real diversity to the lending and borrowing base. Now, regulators, politicians, and others, they're always more protective of retail investors because they, not that I'm being cynical, but of course they are expected to not have the sophistication of institutional investors. Although 
I, I have to tell you, I've been on Reddit and, and Wall Street bets for some time. There are some pretty darn sophisticated retail investors out there who would stack up very well compared to a number of institutional investors I've met over the years. But look, enabling both retail and uh, institutional investors to participate in the market uh, creates opportunities for income for everyone. It improves the liquidity in the markets, all the things I went and talked about last week, last week's video about why emerging markets would bring in securities lending. So liquidity and of course, price discovery. And the more participation retail investor, foreign domestic, uninhibited by taxes, enabled by the operating infrastructures in the market in synthetics or cash, all of this makes for an outstanding and successful marketplace. So again, if you want to learn more about any of these things, because I can probably do a video on any of the subtopics that I've talked about here, we've got the free primer on security lending. We've got the new course coming, the introduction to financial markets and role of securities lending, which uh, hopefully I'll finish this week. I said that last, it's been a difficult week. And we have the, uh, the big daddy, the introduction to securities lending course, if you really want to become an expert. Right, let's just do a summary of this. We talked about the new lending markets roadmap for legal and tax issues. It's possible for lending to occur with a lack of clarity on these issues. But if it is, it's not going to be that active. If you can say, well, I'm willing to accept some tax risk, you're not going to accept a lot of tax risk or, and you're going to limit your activity to the most profitable transactions. In terms of transactions and structures, they, as they say, they come in many different flavors. And the reality is the more flavors you have out there on the menu, the more likely you are to have satisfied guests and customers. Synthetic equity fixed income, the reality is you want to have as many opportunities to do that. And in order to go long and short, you need to be able to lend or borrow as well as finance, either be a cash lender against those securities or as a cash borrower, putting that up as collateral. And then finally, participation, open cross-border activity, foreign investors, domestic investors, retail investors, institutional investors. That's really what makes a securities finance the most successful in a market, enabling it to power the liquidity, price discovery, and reduced operating costs that it brings to markets. So that's it for this next week, part 25, I think now, not 24. We're going to be talking about the final installment to emerging markets and securities lending. And I look forward to seeing you next week. So that's it for me. Thanks for joining me again on a Saturday. If you like what we're doing, give us a, or a thumbs up. Great to see you here. Have a great Saturday. Have a great weekend. Have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you next week.